you, John, and uh, thank you all for listening to me while you have lunch. Um, my talk to you today is to try and persuade you that that little brown guy sitting in the corner is a much cheaper way of looking at ecosystem health than the large yellow thing that he's sitting on. Both of them, uh, most of the work is funded through NOAA, so um, I think our administrator would appreciate trying to find cheaper ways to do business. Um, but before I start, I would like to thank the Pacific Life Foundation, especially Bob Hassel, and also apologize that this will be my only humpback where I could go around. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about California sea lions and um, try and really explain to you why, really from a veterinarian's perspective, I think they can tell us a lot about ocean health, even if they are common, abundant, um, and sort of the, the marine underdog of the world, if you like. So, well, first of all, they live along our California coast, um, you can find them from Baja up to, to British Columbia. So if we're looking at changes in coastal systems, they are really an integrator of these waters. They're also common, as we've heard yesterday, so you can actually get your hands on them. They're able to sample them, you can sample them on the rookeries, you can also sample them when they try and sit. And um, most importantly, they actually have a mammalian physiology on you know, top of the food chain, so if we're looking at health changes that can impact people, and we might do that really so that we can get the public's awareness, as we've heard in some of the earlier talks, how do you get people excited about changes? And one way is if they think those changes will impact them. Um, and another really um, sort of obvious statement is actually they're quite cute. So if you're talking to kids from Kansas, they care if the sea lions sit. They're not so excited about changes in sea cucumber density, but sea shrimp sea lions generally um, grab people's attention. So um, health changes that we see in them, um, we can, at a stretch, try and link some of these to climate change, coastal development, urbanization. Um, but these are really links, and I think John brought up in his, his question is, is that really what we're looking at? Or are we looking at long-term changes in health that we don't understand, but we need to try and understand how they fit within that context? So here's a quick summary of a, a sea lion's life cycle for those of you who aren't aware. They pretty much start off straight west of here on the on the Channel Islands. Um, pups are born, they suckle for um, up to a year of females. And then there's moving to the animals up and down the coast. So I live in San Francisco on the bottom. We tend to have the, the, the rally males that come up the parties at the 39. And um, then we go further north and get into even more trouble eating salmon and um, hanging out in places like fish tigers. So they are they are mobile, they are on land, we can get hold of them. And, they often get into trouble. So one thing to think about when we're thinking about health and disease is that diseases aren't evenly distributed, distributed throughout the population. So the, the graph in the middle is um, a representation of the number of parasites in the population of California sea lions, with the number of animals affected on the, on the y side. And what that's telling us is that most animals have very few parasites, and then very few animals have lots of parasites. Most diseases do exactly the same thing. So when we look at stranded animals, we're looking at a very small percentage of the population, but they're more likely to be sick. And then most of the animals that are in the have the lower prevalence of disease, and that's the overall healthy population. And that's something to bear in mind, because you can use the stranded animals then almost as a sentinel of the overall population. We can look for them for emerging diseases or changes that we might not be aware of if we're looking at hundreds of animals out of so the three diseases I'm going to talk about today are health changes. Uh, one is associated with poisoning by biotoxins. The second is cancer that we have links to contaminant exposure. And then the third is an infectious disease that can also affect people, uh, leptospirosis. So starting with tomorrow gas, I'm afraid you probably can't see the red dots here, but the upper map shows the number of harmful algal blooms that were reported in 1970. And then we look at the lower map, that's the number of harmful algal blooms worldwide that reported in 2006. And the take home message is there are a lot more red dots on the bottom than above. And there are a number of different reasons for this, many of them are seriously up for debate. And the only thing we can say now is probably in the early 90s we were concerned that some of these harmful algal blooms that we were seeing were a consequence of, of better reporting, better communication between just people studying phytoplankton and kind of looking at team over here, and some of the people who think green animals. But I would say for the past 10 years, we're still seeing a steady increase in the number, the distribution, the duration of some of these harmful algorithms 
that produce toxins that can impact human and animal health. So domotic acid is, uh, is the one that we see most commonly here in California. It's a water-soluble amino acid that's produced by glutamine and it's a very simple molecule that binds to glutamate receptors on neurons. And any cell that has a glutamate receptor will be impacted by domotic acid when it binds to that receptor. But the neurons that have most glutamate receptors are found in a particular part of the brain called the hippocampus, because it's shaped like sepals, but it's the part of the brain that's responsible for short-term memory, uh, spatial map uh, navigation, and some of the uh, behavioral uh, aspects to, to mammalian cognition. Demotic acid itself was, was first recognized as a problem with human health after an alpha bloom in Prince William Sound, uh, Prince Edward Sound, uh, Edward Island, sorry, in um, 1987. And at that time, there was a, a bloom that juice toxin accumulated in muscles that were farmed. And about 100 people ate those muscles and had seizures. And about four people died, but some of the people that lived then had long-term memory loss. So the moment acid poisoning of people has become known as amnesic shellfish poisoning, or ASP. So the moment acid itself was um, first recognized as a problem for marine mammals back in um, 1998. That still seems a very vivid weekend for me. There was a cluster of California sea lions seizuring in Monterey Bay on the pier, and um, that weekend was actually the Memorial Day weekend, and the, um, it was International Year of the Ocean celebrations, and all the newspapers were there, and they had pictures of Clinton and Paul walking down the beach, and you see that in the in front of them, and it's like, oceans, not so blue, and you know, what's going on? And one sea lion actually had a seizure on CNN, spurting out of fetus, and then mum and pup died on TV. So that certainly got people interested. And uh, the story I always like to tell when you wonder about how to get the public and the comment that it is known as amnesic shellfish poisoning, and Clinton was there eating those anchovies. So he should he should actually use that in his defense at some point. So I don't remember I ate the anchovies. <laughs> anyway, at that time in 98, there was a really good correlation between um, plankton in in water samples collected from Monterey Bay. Um, satellite imagery showing high chlorophyll that goes through the in red, and then demotic acid levels in the fish and in sea lion blood urine and feces. And we had these cute these clusters of California sea lions that were seizuring and dying. So that was a really nice correlation between clearly there was this balloon that was producing this toxin, it was eaten by the, the prey species but the sea lions, the sea lions ate it, had the seizures, and we thought this is great. And the other thing that happened was that the sea lions died before demotic acid was detected in mussels that are used as part of the state um, uh, food safety monitoring program. This is for mussels, so it takes a while for the biotoxins to accumulate in the lower uh, part of the water column that they feed on. So since 1998, there have been a number of repeated um, other bloom events that have affected marine animals, especially here in Southern California. And uh, this slide, I have to admit, was um, from 2003, and at that time I had circles that matched the color of the number of species. And then, since then, we've pretty much had demonic acid producing blooms every year. So I just added some black text every year and kept us on the side. So it's probably time to move on. But the message is that we first saw it in 98, but since then, every year, pretty much between April and November, there are these demonic acid producing blooms um, along the coast. And interestingly, if we actually go back and look at our stranding data, the graph on the bottom right shows the number of California sea lions admitted to the Marine Animal Center, so in central California, that have had seizures over the years. And um, the, the, uh, you can see 98 when we first saw, um, first saw outbreaks. When we went back through our records, we found that there was a cluster of animals in 92 and 93 that had very similar clinical signs and seizures, so probably were impacted by the more acid. We just didn't recognize it at the time. Um, this is what it looks like, so um, I think it's a pretty characteristic presentation. This is a gulf on a sea lion in Monterey Bay. So the animals um, eat, eat the fish, and within four hours they're having pretty dramatic seizures. Um, the seizures get progressively worse if the animals are treated. They die if they are picked up by the public or called, we can bring them in. And the animals are treated with sedatives like valium fluids, and the biotoxin is cleared from the system in about four hours. So even though it's, it's, a, it's a very dramatic toxin, it's a very acute toxicosis, um, recovery is possible after a small dose if the animal is treated. 
Um, and this is what the brain looks like histologically. This is a slide, especially for Julie's measure, so you can pick on her. Um, it shows a section of the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that we see most damaging. And uh, I guess you really can't see in this slide, but what we see is dead neurons and then also holes where the neurons have literally just dropped out in the hippocampus. And the reason we care about this is that since 98, we've also seen a number of health policy lines doing pretty odd things, especially consider that they're smart animals. So we've seen them in artichoke fields, uh, in the Central Valley, we've seen them in airports. Uh, one guy was um, often like to get up on hot cars and get arrested, and we think it's because they like the, the warm bonnet and the engine's been running for a while. But still, they're in strange places that they shouldn't really be. And um, this made us wonder about was, was there an impact on spatial navigation or memory due to these lots of neurons in the hippocampus? So if an animal had survived either these acute seizures or had eaten a low dose, were there some more subtly or chronic effects that might have um, other impacts on the animal's uh, behavior? So the top left shows two different sea lion brains. The left is a normal brain, and you can see the little curly seahorse-shaped structure. That's the hippocampus. And the right part of that slide shows a sea lion's brain that has been previously affected by dimonic acid. It survived and then several months later died, and the hippocampus is shown right down to a really tiny structure. And then the bottom is the histology from that same animal where you can see that there's, there's basically no neurons left in that hippocampus. So interestingly, in London there was a study looking at London cab drivers. And uh, in London, to become a cab driver, you have to be able to pass this basic test before you get your license. And you have to learn about London, and you also have to find the quickest way to get from different restaurants to the theatre so people can get there on time and have a nice dinner and not miss the play. And they call it the knowledge. And what um, this, this group of doctors did is did an MRI study of London cab drivers and then your average member of the British public. I don't say American public because. <laughs> Thoughts about how they use maps, but that uh, would be, sorry. Um, anyway, what we found is that the um, London cab drivers had significantly larger hippocampi than the average member of the public, and they proposed that the hippocampus was actually plastic, and um, when it was involved in spatial memory and used a lot, you could expand the number of hippocampal cells. So we thought, well, what the converse applies? If you lose your hippocampal cells, can you navigate and how you get on, especially if you're a animal that needs to know? Where to go. Um, and one of the interesting parts as well that we found that when examiners have died is that hippocampal lesions are often unilateral, they're not symmetrical, which is very bizarre for a, a systemically ingested toxin. So, what we did is we took um, light sea lions that recovered from acute poisoning and we put them through an MRI machine in San Francisco, this happens to be yet to at night with a black trash bag over their back ends. Um, and then looked at the hippocampal volume on these animals and then um, recovered them and, and basically can feed and then we went on to release them. And uh, we've got some lovely three-dimensional images where you can actually get a one metric analysis on the hippocampus and then relate that to the animal's future behavior. The other thing we did before we seen them was um, monitor brain activity through EEG genes for having an animal like this. And then we found that animals that had been pre-exposed to tonic acid had this whole series of little subclinical seizure events going on. So there were continual discharges from neurons, but not at a level to cause seizures. So the animal basically looked normal if you looked at it, but on MRI had shown the hippocampus and on EEG was having mild subclinical seizures um, all over the brain. These animals were then released with a satellite tag that recorded the patient and dying. And we found essentially that out of 20 animals, only one actually didn't take off and go towards the right. So that's a map on the right of the sea line, heading straight to the island from the Pacific, never turned right, never turned left, and just didn't seem to be able to um, use the normal cruise for the sea line road. Um, and all those animals did die. The one that lived actually went up to Oregon and went to the hot springs and was found in a spa. <laughs> <laughs> it's very intelligent, these guys. <laughs> So it's uh, obviously an effect on our ability to navigate. The other um, sub-lethal uh, aspect would be looking at its effects on, on reproduction. And uh, when we first had these acute tonic acid um, events, we realized that many of the animals that died were pregnant. 
And then if we looked at levels of chloric acid in the fetus or in the amniotic fluid from those animals, they were really high. And um, one really interesting feature, I mentioned earlier that chloric acid is ingested, it enters the bloodstream and is cleared in about four hours through the kidneys, it's water soluble toxin. But when we looked at some of these fetuses, again, this might be hard to read, but it's levels of chloric acid in fetal fluids in different animals, we found in one case a fetus seen on an epicenter of 14 days, then died. And there were still high levels of demoic acid in the amniotic fluid from that fetus. And now we're in a series of these types of measurements on fluids from fetuses, amniotic fluid, then females. And what we think is happening is that when an animal is pregnant, if she takes in a low level of blood to cross the now, that demoic acid crosses the placenta in the bloodstream, and then once it gets into the fetus, the fetal kidneys will clear it and put it out into the fetal urine. But the fetal urine goes into amniotic fluid. And then the fetus will re swallow it. So therefore, can't get out from the fetus. The fetus is essentially acting as a sink for a water soluble toxin that the female ingests during pregnancy. Uh, so, this I think is something that um, you know, really raises concerns about what are the, the low subclinical levels that might be more important than the population level. So, to match that to what was happening out in the islands, we went out to San Miguel Island, west of here. Long San Miguel there has been a high level of premature parturition observed in some lands since the 60s. Um, every year, about April, May, there are young pups that are born about two months prematurely and they die because they're too um, premature to, to um, basically function normally. And since the 60s, there have been a considerable amount of work looking at the potential role of DDTs, infectious diseases, on premature parturition. So, what we did over two years. Um, 2005 2006, is we collected these um, dead fetuses, dead premature pups, and then looked at contaminants, infectious diseases, but also demoic acid in fluids and samples from those fetuses as well as the feces from the females. And um, what we found is some of, some of the premature pups were indeed um, infected with infectious diseases that were caused in blood failure. Um, so I'm keeping over my shoulder here. But, um, about a third of those fetuses had got the levels of chloric acid that would have been enough to account for reproductive failure. So it suggests that the proportion of reproductive failure on the rookeries is due to demoic acid. Um, so what really what we think is happening is um, it's this effect of, of demoic acid moving into the fetus and it acting as a sink where it can't get out from the female. And another supplemental effect that we've been working on is effects on the heart. So I mentioned demoic acid binds to glutamate receptors. Most of those receptors are on the neurons in the hippocampus, but some of them are on cardiac muscle. And we've noticed that many of the C-lines that die have very pale cardiac uh, musculature. So we've been dissecting our hearts and looking at the distribution of glutamate receptors in the heart. And sure enough, what we find is that the uh, distribution of glutamate receptors on the heart follows the conducting system, and the dead cells in the heart follow that same distribution and that when we look carefully at animals like we have done before and monitor these seizures, we find that there are arrhythmias in those animals that appear normal. So they can die suddenly of cardiac arrest because of an arrhythmia developing in the cardiac muscle. So really, we have a whole series of effects now. Apart from acute seizures, we're aware of changes in the hippocampus that can affect um, uh, spatial navigation, likelihood to become epileptic in, in later life. We see effects on uh, reproduction and then we see these cardiac effects. And these latter subclinical chronic effects are the ones that generate the most interest from the human medical community because there's it's a high level of epilepsy in um, coastal populations. There are many unexplained causes of, of cardiac arrest, and um, uh, those are probably the areas that people are most likely to be affected if you think of the fact that the, there's a regulatory limit on the amount of demoic acid in the sea for which are parts per million because that can cause seizures. But these low repeated exposures, we have no real way of, of monitoring any seafood that we eat for those low levels of biotoxin that are, from the phytoplankton data, out there and um, quite commonly. So the area that we're focusing on now is what are the developmental effects if you think of those animals that were in utero and exposed to fetuses, what happens to them if they weren't burned prematurely and they didn't die? What's, what's happening to those? Are there sea lions out there that were exposed in utero and how has that impacted their development? So that's something that we're really concerned with, sort of ongoing change in remember health. 
So switching gear to another health change, um, this one is, is cancer, but everyone knows about cancer. And the, the fascinating thing to me is that about a fifth of the adult sea lions that we proxy have cancer in the reproductive tract, which is probably the most, it is the highest prevalence of cancer in any wild animal. And um, we used to think it was, well, we'll just get the stranded animals, but recently you know, the number of sea lions culled because they've been eating salmon at one little dam, and we've tried to use those animals as controls for some of the work we're doing. And most of them have got lesions on the penis that suggest early cancer. So they're little peripheral lesions on the, on the penis. So um, the bottom graph is the number of sea, the prevalence of sea lions dying with cancer per year. And some of the uh, decreases in prevalence that we see in more recent years is really just um, an effect of more adults dying from toric acid in recent years. So the relative proportion of animals dying from cancer has decreased. It starts in the reproductive tract and then spreads to lymph nodes that are under the spine. And then once those lymph nodes really expand to the rose spine, then the animal usually dies of paralysis or metastases to the lung and the liver. So it does kill them. This is um, the slide that Randy's been waiting for. So the top left is a, is a penis, an adult male, where he's got a small plaque, which is an early cancer. And then the bottom is the um, cervix of a female, and you can see a small little model in there, which is the beginning of cancer in the cervix. So that's how it starts, very small, tiny plaque. And then if we look at these plaques histologically, we can see inclusions within cells that are typical of, of viruses, especially herpes viruses. So a few years back, we did electron microscopy, we got PCR, and actually detected a virus that was new to renal viral growth, uh, which we call C9 herpes virus 1. And it was persistently present in these inclusions from these um, early cancer cases. So our question then was, how, how, um, how strongly is it associated with cancer? Is this just a herpes virus that likes to grow in fast-growing cells? That's what herpes viruses do. Or is it something that's really involved in driving the etiology and development of the cancer? So we collected reproductive tracts, lymph nodes, body parts from sea lions dying from other causes. This is a German epidemic that was first this year. And they extracted DNA and looked at the distribution of the herpes um, DNA segment in animal tissues dying with and without cancer. So this graph sort of starts from the, the head on the, on the left and the tail on the right, so it's um, trachea going right through to a vagina, and then um, red is sea lines with tumors and blue is without. And the take home message is that most of the virus is in the bottom end of the sea line, and animals with cancer have far more virus than animals without, but there is still some virus present in non-cancer cells. So again, we went out to San Miguel and we sampled wild sea lions in the recruit and looked at what is the prevalence of this virus in sea lions that, as far as we can tell, have no cancer, at least what we tell from, from looking at them. So um, we sampled 250 animals of different ages and we saw their noses and their um, reproductive uh, tracts or orifices. And uh, what we found is that young animals had really no virus. Um, uh, yearlings, there was nothing there. By the time they were um, becoming adults, there was a um, significant infection in apparently healthy animals, but infection was twice as common in males than females. Uh, and the infection, 43% uh, of adult males were infected in the crepus, and half of that um, females. But again, there was a little bit of virus in that brain. So um, this suggests that we have a sexually transmitted virus that's spreading to females and females, and um, males are more likely to have higher prevalence of virus in a religious system. And uh, so that raises the question then, is, is it what's causing the cancer? We only see the cancer in adults, the first age, the animals first get infected. So in humans, there are a number of virally, uh, of cancers that have a strong viral association. But most of those require some sort of cofactor. Um, so for example, the cosy sarcoma in humans is a herpes virus, very similar to the virus of CMAS, but it usually only causes cancer or immunocompromised in some way. So this is a list of some of the common cofactors that we see in people that allows viruses to cause cancer in, in people. So the obvious one for us in the animals are the metabolites, the organic We all know that these are prevalent in the environment, they are um, lipophilic, they accumulate up the food chain, and there's certainly been plenty of DDT just here at the California bite. So what we did is we sampled blubber from California sea lions that, that died from cancer and also died from other causes such as tumor gas you know, gunshot injuries. And then compare the levels of PCBs, a whole suite of different um, organic chlorines, but especially PCBs, DDTs, DDEs, and compare 
the concentration in the lipid from both groups of animals. And this is really the key. These compounds um, accumulate in the lipid. Blubber is mostly lipid, but anywhere between 70 and 80 the lipid. But if you have cancer and you get sick, you start to lose that lipid from your blood. So any animal dying from cancer is going to have a lower lipid level than an animal dying from something else that's acute. That then means that the contaminants in that, in that lipid that are going to be concentrated because you're going to get higher levels, or they're going to be mobilized and go into the circulation. So if you're measuring a concentration in a chunk of blood at one time point, what does it really mean? So on this graph, on the, on the right, you can see um, we divide animals with cancer on the left bar without cancer on the right. And we either express the contaminants as a percentage of lipid or a percentage of weight weight. And either way you did it, the animals with carcinoma of cancer had higher levels than that without. So that was kind of exciting. We thought, oh, we're starting to see some potential association of contaminant exposure with cancer. But um, what we then followed up with was we looked at how did the contaminants in lipid change as an animal loses weight. So this is one of the silver linings of animals dying seizures which have been sedated for um, usually about 10 days to two weeks. And during that time, they do lose about 20% of their body weight. So we took a series of biopsy samples when they first came in, and then they lost weight. And then when they started to feed as they got better and gained weight again, and looked at how the contaminant burdens changed in that lover over time. And the left graph here is PCD concentrations in sea lions as they stop eating. And then on the right, PCD concentrations in sea lions as they start to eat again. So what this is really telling us is essentially we can measure a lipid concentration of contaminants, but it's completely influenced by whether that animal is losing weight or gaining weight. And so it's really hard to take a pinpoint measurement of contaminants and say that they you know, are higher or lower in a standard medical epidemiological sense. So we can really say is that they're there, and there are plenty of them, and that in lab animals, they do play a role in carcinogenesis. Another thing that we can do with more gas levels, to, to, to more gas animals, is look at contaminants in mum and pup pets. So females that die when pregnant, we can sample the mothers and sample the pups. And that basically tells us that there's a pretty significant transfer of PCBs and DDTs from the mother to the fetus across the placenta. Again, we can't take that much further than that, but at least it tells us that there is in utero exposure to contaminants that we know of rodent work, if, if uh, um, a rodent is exposed in utero to some of these particular PCD functions, it will have an altered reproductive tract in later life, an altered distribution of endocrine receptors that would make it more susceptible to carcinogen in later life. And the third aspect to this cancer work is, um, is the thought that many cancers also have uh, genes that predispose people to developing those issues. So in some early work, Karina Asagay Whitehouse was looking at ingredients in sea lions to try and determine if sea lions that stranded were sort of an inbred loser piece of the population that we should just get rid of. So what she did is she, she looked at um, ingredients by looking at a suite of microsatellites in DNA extracted from skin samples. And she looked at animals dying from different causes, from parasitism, gunshot injuries, to orgasm. And she found that the animals in the far left here that were significantly more inbred than any of the others as measured by diversity of these microsatellites, were the animals that died of cancer. So, okay, they're more inbred, there has to be some genetic component to this cancer as well. But a few years later, we went back and, oh, she actually yeah, went back and we looked at some of these data and found that there was one particular microsatellite, PD11, that was really driving this relationship. It wasn't just a general difference in heterozygosity across these microsatellites, but it was one specific part of the one specific microsatellite. And at that time, we knew nothing about the sea lion genome. So she looked at where this microsatellite sat within the dog genome. And interestingly, in the dog, PB11 sits within a gene known as heparinase 2, which in people is associated with cancer in the fibula lungs. It reduces the ability to prevent spread and metastases of cancers. So this was pretty exciting, and that's um, basically where we are. Uh, we know that the PB11 in, in dogs may be within this gene associated with cancer, and this gene is um, uh, associated with increased susceptibility. We've also done some work with you know, NHC, which is a part of the genome responsible for recognition of foreign proteins or other viruses. 
And our hypothesis here was maybe there's a genetic predisposition to this herpes virus, which then alters the animal's ability to resist infection. And we found that there was one particular allele that was associated with cancer susceptibility in a small group of sea lions um, uh, from one specific area. And we found that since then there's some complexities and <coughs> spatial differences in NHC in the health of sea lions. So overall, this is kind of where we are, is that cancer is a, a multi-step process. It usually involves um, an initiator and a promoter, two different steps to actually get the total transformation of a cell from a normal cell to a cancer cell. So a, a general hypothesis is that there's some early mutation. This could happen in utero, even if there's in utero exposure to some of these contaminants. We get this virus coming in at sexual maturity, which would be a second insult, which would allow um, the, the transformation of the cell to a carcinoma cell, and then there's a step where that carcinoma spreads from being localized to generalized, which may involve the genetic step. So, um, a complex process, but uh, I think my take on message here is that sea lions, and maybe many of them, but they do get cancer, and some of the parts of that pathway do involve contaminants that are in our food chain that, that we eat. So, some indication of, of a change in, in or a, 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 a real health problem that isn't um, ubiquitous. So my final disease, and this one, this one will be quick. Um, leptospirosis is an infectious disease that affects all um, mammals, including people. It's a bacteria. It's a um, it's a really complex. They call it a sort of gene um, uh, it, um, species complex because it used to be tied to serology or how um, hosts develop antibodies to the organism. But with the onset of a lot more gene sequencing, there have been 20 different species recognized based on genetics as distinct from the host's ability to develop antibodies. So that having said, there are a whole suite of these virus, and they've potentially been considered in two different groups. Ones that are adapted to the host, and when they're in that host, they don't really cause disease. They usually have the kidneys, they're there, they're shown in the urine, and they don't really cause disease. And then we have host non-adapted strains that when they get from their adapted host into spillover host, they can cause really severe disease, liver disease typically, um, jaundice and kidney disease. So the, the typical story that you probably heard about is leptospirosis in people who get infected as spillover hosts from rodent leptospira adapted strains when they swim in water that's contaminated by rodent pee. So if you go to Hawaii, you'll see signs on stagnant freshwater areas saying do not swim in danger rats. And that's not just going to bite them out of parts because they could be um, transmitting like a in the urine. It's very common. There are outbreaks in um, Southeast Asia in people working in rice paddies that are regularly associated with heavy rainfall um, and changes in road distribution in the rice paddies. And then, so more dramatically, there have been cases in, in often athletes that are doing some of these sort of super activities and running, biking, swimming across Australia, and they all go through one piece of contaminated water and their outbreaks. There was recently a, um, an Olympic canoeist actually who died in, in London after swimming in the tents. So never swimming rivers. Um, so here we have um, leptospirosis in California sea lions, which manifests itself as a kidney infection. The animals die uh, of renal failure. So, um, and when they're mildly infected, they'll drink water, which they don't normally do. So well, you should get calls from the public saying there's a sea lion sucking water or sucking, sucking on a rock or trying to basically take in fresh water. And uh, the blood work is actually indicates kidney failure. When they die, the kidneys are large, swollen, and pale. And on any history on the far right, you can see left spiral organisms throughout the kidneys. So it usually happens in, in juvenile males, and the outbreaks are typically in the fall between about September and November. And they occur at regular intervals and can be pretty dramatic. This is a, um, a time series of California sea lions coming into our facility in Sausalito. The bars in black are just sea lions dying from all causes, and then the red are the numbers of animals dying from leptospirosis. And you'll see there's some periodicity to, to these outbreaks in California sea lions. And uh, about in 2000, um, we thought they pretty much occurred at four year intervals, and we were very excited. And they were told me, nope, they always happen after El Nino, and so I think this is another example of. The longer the time series, the more other factors start to come in. But, but this got us excited about the time series of disease. Um, leptospirosis in people is considered to be really impacted by environmental drivers, especially rainfall. So we were interested in how these outbreaks 
relate to changes in, uh, in rainfall, the La Nino, and sea land distribution, and perhaps where they go during many years. So, um, so most outbreaks in California seem to start um, just south of the Monterey Bay area. We usually get a few calls on sea lands in about September, and that's where the first cases start to occur in young male sea lands. And then as the months go on, we'll see more and more cases. So this is a, a video that shows the number of cases of sea lions and leptospirosis over the years. And you'll see little red dots running up and down, but they, they always seem to start somewhere in that um, uh, just south of the Bay area. So if you think about it, there's many different explanations um, for that. If we're seeing these regular outbreaks starting at a particular place, it could be that there is spillover from a, a terrestrial host somewhere in that area that only happens occasionally and then we're getting um, a non-host adapted strain into these sea lions and they, they get big disease outbreaks. Alternatively, you could look at a completely different way and say the sea lions have an endemic leptospira within their kidneys and then we only get outbreaks when there's either changes in the antigenicity of that, that parasite, something sets it off, or there's changes in host resistance. So there's either more susceptibles coming into the population, they're moving in a different way, um, they're aggregating a different way of transmission. So we have two sort of very different explanations which have different consequences on interpretation of, of interactions between terrestrial and ocean systems. Um, so the first thing we did was just look at antibody levels <laughs> in California sea lands over the years in different age classes. And we found that sure enough there was a similar period of in the antibody levels of the sea in the sea lands. So the animals that were surviving developed antibodies and then um, once those animals which uh, got older and new sea lands were drawn into the population, we had a, a population of animals with no antibodies. So cycles in immunity that could allow some um, cyclicity in, in the disease without the need for a new introduction. Um, then, I'm not a lot of us, Karen knows, but this is um, some work that Jamie Lloyd Smith has been doing at UCLA, and he basically looked at a suite of different environmental parameters, and then said, okay, if we have changes in immunity within the population, can we actually look at ways that we can generate cycles in this disease based on simply changes in sea lion immunity and changes in the environment? And uh, uh, this um, the black line on, on this graph is the number of sea lions um, in the last uh, I think is, uh, 14 years are dying of leptospirosis. And then the um, yellow line is looking at if we just considered an influx of susceptibles with sea lions being born on the rookeries, moving up the California coast, and then some dying and being taken out by the disease. Let me see, how well does that fit? And then we looked at just simply different um, indices of upwelling. We started looking at Monterey Bay area, but interestingly, this particular model is using data off Mendocino. And we found if you combine susceptibles and um, an index of upwelling from the Mendocino coast, we get a really good fit to um, predicting numbers of animals dying from our sources. So at this point, we don't think that there's a, a land to sea transmission of a rodent. <coughs> Uh, bacteria, but instead we think it's endemic within sea lands, and that there are environmental drivers that result in this um, outbreak of disease. But how that happens at this point, we, we really don't understand. But it's, if you're in the world of disease and climate, it's of interest you can say, there are um, models showing that El Nino, for example, is associated with cholera outbreaks in people in Bangladesh. So there's quite a bit of interest in how does pathogen survival change with changes in rainfall and temperature. So, I think at this point, I've given you a whole class of different sea lion diseases. Um, what I'd like to go home is realizing that even though there are a lot of sea lions out there, there are health changes in them that, as a bet, they certainly raise concern in my mind about what are the, what is a healthy ocean? And it's simply, do we measure health simply in terms of abundance? There's certainly plenty of sea lions, how many is enough? Or do we get concerned about things like brain damage, abortion? cancer and outbreaks of infectious disease that are driven by changes in prey distribution or weather. So with that, I'd like to thank my anonymous dark people <laughs> here. That's pretty much everyone who works on health on the sea lines and the coastal community for contributing in some way to this talk today.
I thought the connection to a human health were kind of surprising how many different things you were looking at in California. So you know, the human health. And the contaminant one especially uh, caught my interest. Uh, is using whole body burden of contaminants a way to get around that kind of you uh, So you're looking at the whole body load of computing lipid content of the whole animal and how much total. It, it is. And then you have to know exactly how much blood and lipid and um, different body parts. But you can do that. You can blend the whole.
will utilize any animal with damage to the campus. Um, the problem we're facing now is really cute little baby sea lion pups that are born at Pier 39, and we know that probably happened because the female was disorientated, so it's probably going to have some developmental effect. But they're really cute, and people want them. So, uh, does that help? Yeah. I have a question. Um, how representative are the sea lions of the rest of the marine mammals? Because it, I worry partly that there's a lot of contact with humans. I mean, yeah. they're kind of, you know, more in contact with, with diseases. So it, are they represented? Um, that's a great question. I, I, I don't think we even know. Because there, there are species that, you know, they're coastal. We can look at them. We can different age classes. Elephant seals, the only elephant seals that we scrap, for example, are um, recently we young pups. So in my whole climate mammal I've only need to see two adult elephant seals. And yes, the population is increasing, but they must die of something. We have no idea what. Um, I think I'm sorry, I'm right more like animals as well. All whales die of shit strike. And they're sure they're like shit strike because they're large and they're rotten and we can find broken bones. But how would we know if a blue whale that was in the Santa Barbara Channel hit by ship, how would we know that it didn't actually have an atrophy of the campus from previous chlorine acid exposure and it couldn't, it couldn't navigate in that way? And so I think we know so little about the health changes in other animals, especially in different age and sex classes, that we can't ask that. No, great. So um, we thought it was high, and actually, if you talk to a lot of the um, biologists who work with sea lions for a long time, they'll say, "Oh, I had leptospirosis once, and I was in San Diego, and I had leptospirosis once." And so I thought, "Really, what were the symptoms?" Because I've had a lot of sea lions. Um, you finished your lunch now. One of my biggest ones. Go, I think I swallowed one once because I was doing yeah, the sea lion because it was um, she was pregnant and I cut up the uterus and then I was talking to someone and I was going, like, "Poop." <laughs> I think I swallowed a sea lion. So, um, and a sea lion had leptospirosis. So, the good news is I didn't get pregnant, and you can't get pregnant by uh, that way. <laughs> but the, but so, recently, I've so got a lot of being exposed. So, either I'm, you know, got high immunity or pathogen somehow adapted to sea lions. So, we did a, the CDC actually recently came in with a serious survey of all our volunteers. So, we looked at um, just over 500 people uh, with a questionnaire and blood samples, and um, only one person had antibodies to leptospirosis. And, and that person was a relatively new volunteer who had just come to this country. So we haven't got any evidence of it getting into people, which is really surprising. Well, let's uh, thank you.